I feel I feel really sorry for James Anderson, actually. You know, I mean, chap's had a lot of grief, and um, he's not here to defend himself. Um, we don't know that. Well, I can't see him. Um, it's quite interesting, actually. I mean, the one thing which Susan um, Susan's talk demonstrated to me was the considerable difference between the 1723 constitutions and the 1738 constitutions. And the reason for that is that the 1723 constitutions were written by Anderson as a hired pen. I think that's a phrase that Andrew used. Okay. And it's absolutely right. He was relatively impoverished. He was looking to make some money. And he was doing, broadly speaking, what he was told. And his contribution was the history and so on and so forth. And of course, Payne and Desagulier were contributing uh, elsewhere with the charges and the regulations. And in 1738, the constitutions are written, broadly speaking, by Anderson himself as a whole. And as my colleagues pointed out, he was, paged, he was paid by the page, which explains its length and uh, relative um, incomprehensibility. <laughs> now, I didn't come here to talk about Anderson specifically, but I thought I'd mention that um, by way of an intro. I came to talk about the context because you can't understand or appreciate what happened in 1717 through to 1721 without an appreciation of the background. What was happening in English society and in European society? What were the drivers that led to the creation of a Grand Lodge? Because clearly there was a substantive change at the beginning of the 18th century. Before the 18th century, Freemasonry is virtually unknown. There is almost no press no public attention. But from the 1720s, the organization takes off. It has a structure. It attracts not only the aristocracy, members of the gentry, but the aspirational class writ large. Now, this didn't happen overnight. It happened as part of a process. And what I want to talk about is the background to that process, the key drivers. Susan mentioned two very important events, the Edict of Nantes, and the expulsion of James II from the throne and his replacement by William and Mary. A period when Protestantism and Catholicism were facing off within Europe. And Protestantism was on the losing side. France had a huge standing army, a population somewhere between 12 and 14 million. England, by contrast, had a population of around four to four and a half, perhaps five million, a relative minnow, precisely the same sort of population as Ireland at the time. England was under threat. Queen Anne died, 1714, the last of the Stuart monarchs, and her replacement was the Elector of Hanover. Prince George, the closest Protestant monarch. James Stuart, Queen Anne's half-brother, was the closest living relative, but he was a Catholic, and the Act of Settlement had barred Catholics from the, what was now the British throne. But the population as a whole were not united behind George the first. There were many segments, not only Catholics, who would have preferred to have seen James Stuart rule as James III. Those who believed in the divine right of kings and those who felt threatened by the Whigs coming to office, the Tory landowners in particular. So when George I was crowned in October 1714, riots broke out in some 20 cities across England. London wasn't immune. There was rioting in Whitechapel. And the Earl of Mar, one of the great defenders of James Stuart, used the opportunity to return from exile, landed in Scotland, and raised the Stuart banner at Braemar. And within months, a huge swathe of Scotland had gone over to the Stuart cause. 
as did part of Northumberland and Cumberland and Durham. And a Jacobite army marched south as far as Lancashire. The newly installed George I and his Whig ministry were more than concerned. The army was marched up, habeas corpus was suspended, and the Jacobites were eventually defeated in the first few months of 1716. Some of their leaders were executed, others were pardoned as a means of facilitating some form of um, agreement with them. Many were sent to the American colonies. But the Jacobite threat wasn't over. People, when they look at the Jacobite threat, think of 1715, think of 1745, and believe that there was a hiatus in the three decades that separated those two events. The threat remained considerable, and it was felt not only by the government, but by the Huguenots, some 50 or 60,000 Huguenots that have found sanctuary in England from persecution in Catholic France. For them, having James Stuart on the throne was an existential risk. James Stuart may have said that he believed in toleration, but he was backed by France and by Spain, absolute Catholic monarchies who continued to persecute their non-Catholic citizens. The Inquisition ruled large, and the Huguenots were concerned that if James Stuart was on the throne, French and Spanish influence would see it being imposed in England. And the government and the Huguenots were not wrong. The settlement of 1716 was followed in 1717 by an attempt at insurrection. The Swedes, in conjunction with the Spanish, plotted to overthrow George I and introduce James Stuart onto the throne. The threat was considered so considerable that despite diplomatic protocol, the Swedish ambassador's residence in London was raided, his papers were seized, and he was arrested. The information had come from secret diplomatic correspondence that had been intercepted by the secret department of the post office, the government department responsible for intercepting, decrypting or decoding mail. Sweden responded by arresting the British ambassador in Stockholm. And Britain defended its position by a press campaign fronted by Daniel Defoe, but managed by the Under Secretary of State, Charles de la Faye, who was responsible not only as Under Secretary for management of the press, but was also the government's chief anti Jacobite spymaster. The insurrection was curtailed and the Swedish ambassador expelled. But when he returned to Stockholm, he continued and the plan was put in force to invade in 1719, once again in conjunction with Spanish support. A fleet of 27 vessels containing some 5,000 men left Cadiz with the intention of landing in the West Country. There, they would pick up support and march on London. There was to be a second landing, simultaneously with the first, on this, time, on this occasion in Scotland, where a small landing force would meet up with the clans and together march down through the length of England, meeting up in London. Fortunately for England, the fleet was dispersed by storms in the Bay of Biscay, rather like the first Spanish Armada, and the surviving vessels were called back to port. 
But the diversionary force, the smaller force that had intended to land in Scotland, did so land there. But again, intelligence from the secret department of the post office was used. Two frigates were sent up to Scotland. They landed a small detachment of marines. And the incipient rebellion was put down. 500 Spanish troops were captured. Just two years later, the Atterbury plot. Francis Atterbury, the Bishop of Rochester, in correspondence with Jacobite spies, Jacobite sympathizers in Britain and with the Stuart court, is at the heart of a plan, again, to raise James Stuart to the, the British throne. These dates are not insignificant. 1717, 1719, 1721. The Jacobite Rising, 1715. The attempt at rapprochement in 1716. Figures in London who were involved with the creation of the Grand Lodge were involved with these events. The Duke of Montague, absolutely die-hard Whig supporter, pro-Hanoverian. The Duke of Richmond, exactly the same. George Payne, a dedicated Whig loyalist. Desagulier, extremely concerned for the well-being of himself, his family, and the Huguenot community writ large. And Charles Delafay, who I've described elsewhere as the most important Freemason in the early 18th century of whom no one has heard. He really was a key figure, the most trusted crown servant in government. Not only was he Secretary of State, not only was he a senior investigating magistrate, not only was he head of the anti-Jacobite secret intelligence service, but he was also secretary to the, to, the, to the Lord's Justices. When George I went overseas to Hanover, it was his responsibility to act as secretary to those aristocrats charged charged with exercising executive authority in the king's absence, the most important position in the civil service. He was the only man that occupied that position on each of the five occasions that the Lord's Justices met. And what do these people have in common? They were all members of the Rama and Grapes, the Horn Tavern, the lodge behind the creation of Grand Lodge. Because let's not, let's not um, pretend here that this was four lodges coming together as equals to form a Grand Lodge. This was the most important, the most socially and politically connected lodge in London driving this process, using as a veil, I suspect, the participation of the other three lodges, driving this process to create a Grand Lodge that would become, in my view, intentionally, an organization, an instrument that would be used to promote Whig and Huguenot interests, and in particular, latitudinarianism. This is why latitudinarianism is present in the 1723 constitutions and far less overt in the 1738. The Horn Tavern Lodge had over 70 members, had more members in itself than the other three lodges combined. Its members included members of the aristocracy, five of whom had a direct blood link to the crown, senior military figures, generals, colonels, senior judicial figures, magistrates, three of whom were or became chairman of the city, London, or Westminster magistrates' benches, including the first secretary of Grand Lodge, William Cooper. When you read Cooper's cases, which are reported in the press, his pronouncements from the magistrate's bench are the epitome of Hanoverian loyalty. <coughs> cases that were given to Delafay concern treason and sedition. Why were they given to him? Because the government could guarantee they would get the result they wanted. Grand Lodge was created as a construct to push forward pro-Hanoverian, pro-latitudinarian agenda. It took time. 
In particular, it took time for Montague to be persuaded to take the chair. Why should he, a senior, probably the most celebrated aristocrat of his day, one of the wealthiest men in Britain, the son-in-law of the iconic Duke of Marlborough, married to his youngest daughter, incredible figure whose, whose activities are in the press on a daily basis. Why would he associate with this small organization? He would need to be persuaded. And who would do that persuading? Well, one of his best friends, the Duke of Richmond, whose house was next door to his own in Whitehall. George Payne, who was quite well connected. And Desaguliers, a Huguenot. The Duke of Montague's father, the first Duke, had been ambassador to Paris and had seen at first hands how the Huguenots had been treated by the French. The second Duke himself was brought up by Huguenot tutors, surrounded by members of the household who were themselves Huguenots, who had uh, emigrated from France. He was a great sympathizer. So the persuasion of a friend and colleague, the Duke of Richmond, the persuasion of Desaguliers, eminent figure at the Royal Society, known for his ability to educate, to, to lecture, to entertain, persuaded Montague. And they were right to have done so, because when Montague took the chair as Grand Master, and when Grand Lodge at that point solidified with a full set of rules and regulations and patronage that could be utilized, it took off we see an acceleration of interest, interest that would not have been there in advance. And actually, what reason is there for Desaguliers, for Payne, for Delafay and others to have kept this quiet for three or four years? Well, the press wouldn't have had much interest anyway, but the important thing was to launch this, to launch it properly, not to launch it with an unknown at its head but to launch it with one of the most eminent aristocrats in Britain at its head. And the wisdom of them doing so can be seen by the results. Now, before I finish, I want to touch on one, one other thing. This, this, this whole uh, exercise began with Andrew and Susan's paper, Searching for the Apple Tree. And I thought I'd do the same thing, because they're absolutely right, the apple tree tavern did not exist in Charles Street, Covent Garden at the, time that Mont uh, at the time that Anderson says that it did. It didn't exist. Well, Covent Garden at the time, of course, was a fruit and vegetable market, among other things. It included an apple market. And within a short distance of Covent Garden were 15 taverns that either included the name or were called the apple tree. And the closest one to Charles Street in Covent Garden is only about 40 yards away in White Hart Lane, which is just between Charles Street and Drury Lane. And it wouldn't surprise me if Anderson in 1738, when he's putting this stuff down, is looking to make it more detailed and therefore more substantive and more convincing, looks around for the apple tree, he sees it in Charles Street, and he writes down apple tree, Charles Street, Covent Garden, when in all probability, and of course this is only, this is only my view, but in all probability, when he asked who were the four constituent lodges, where were they meeting, please remind me, and someone said it was the apple tree, Covent Garden, rather than put down the apple tree, Covent Garden, which would be completely uncontentious, because there were 15, and it could have been any one of them, he put down the apple tree in Charles Street. And that error invited Andrew, quite rightly, to query the matter and Susan to do so similarly, which is why we may be where we are today. Thank you very much.